everyone knows you could speed up aging from like smoking, for example, but no one really positioned it as, well, you could actually slow it down. What if we were to address all of the hallmarks of aging simultaneously? Welcome to the Seam Lund podcast. My name is Seam Lund, and today our guest is Chris Mirabel. Chris is an entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of Novos Labs. He's also interested in longevity and slowing down his speed of aging. Chris, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm uh, glad to have you. And uh, you are one of those people who are also doing this kind of a Brian Johnson-like experiment with their health and longevity by trying to optimize all these different biomarkers and uh, their biological age um, to like to be on a lower level than their chronological age. So I'm like ha happy to have you on the podcast and we're going to discuss different things of your results and uh, your routines as well of how to people, how, how do they can implement these kind of similar routines related to, you know, diet, exercise and supplements, and also improve their longevity in the process. But how did you like get into this uh, field? And what got you interested in trying to, you know, improve your uh, biological age? Yeah, great question. So I, I've been doing this for a while, actually. Uh, my initial interest in health started when I was 12 years old, and I started reading Men's Health magazine here in the US. And uh, but then when I was 16, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And uh, when you nearly lose your life, you start thinking about different different things and you you look at health in a different way than a typical teenager does. So uh, whereas prior to that experience, I was looking at health from the superficial side of just wanting to be in, in great shape and be attractive and play sports well, after that experience, it turned into a, a deeper appreciation for biology and the avoidance or absence of disease and trying to live as healthy as I can for as long as I can because I never wanted to be laying in a hospital bed again wondering if I would wake up the next morning or not. So that experience had a really profound impact on my perspectives, life perspectives in general, but specifically how I, I looked at health. And so I was interested in longevity from that point forward, though I didn't think of it in the terms of longevity ever since the the scientific and biological approach to lifespan has has started more than ten years ago. Uh, that has has informed my thinking a lot. But at the time, it was really just how can I avoid getting another brain tumor or uh, cancer, heart disease, and so on for that matter. And so. Uh, I've I've been a entrepreneur for my adult life, but in my personal life, I've been kind of obsessive about all of this, about health and optimizing it and spent a lot of time just going straight to the primary sources, leveraging PubMed, for example. Uh, I, I would have ideas in my mind and then I would look for the studies on PubMed and try to come up with my own perspectives on things. And about 10 years ago, uh, as part of that, uh, I came across the paper, The Hallmarks of Aging, which is now a famous paper, is a seminal paper that uh, it was a meta-analysis that looked at many other historical studies, hundreds of them across animals and humans, and it identified the, at the time, nine hallmarks of aging or the nine biological mechanisms that take place when we get older across animals and, and humans. And that was a eye-opening paper for me because it, first of all, it gave me a lens through which I could look at my own aging and disease risk from, right? I could, rather than just uh, quote unquote, trying to be healthy um, and following what like the medical establishment will tell you makes you health healthy, I could actually get to a more fundamental level of health. Uh, that is the biological side of these mechanisms of aging. So the question then turned into, what could I do to optimize these biological hallmarks of aging and slow down their digression. Um, and then uh, the second thing that it, it, it woke me up to was this idea that aging is actually something that's malleable. That concept had never crossed my mind prior to seeing this paper 10 years ago. And uh, that that was so empowering because then I realized that you know, I, everyone knows you could speed up aging from like smoking, for example, but no one really positioned it as, well, you could actually slow it down. And not everything you do for your health is going to slow it down, but certain things, if done properly, can slow it down. So that tr completely transformed my thinking. And um, eventually, a few years ago, and, and we can talk about this, but back in about 2017, 2018, I had an idea for what is now Novos, which is a, a very novel, unique approach to aging. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, the hallmarks of aging are yeah pretty famous right now, and they've actually like updated the list mm -hmm. 
from the original nine hallmarks of aging to now there it's like 13 if i'm not mistaken or 12 and they well, yeah. probably will add a few more in a few uh, years so it's yeah pretty interesting to see like yeah these are the things that go wrong with aging uh, during aging and uh, it also gives you like certain targets to aim for in terms of like therapies and and routines to like you know improve upon exactly yes there, there are, as you mentioned, there are three new hallmarks. Uh, so it was at the 10 year anniversary of that initial paper, the same authors based on uh, additional scientific research that has evolved over the past decade, added three more uh, to those uh, initial nine. So uh, that includes inflammaging, which is this chronic inflammatory state that it, it increases just as we get older, we have more and more inflammation building in our bodies. Uh, another is disabled autophagy. So this is the process in which our, our bodies, our immune systems largely are um, identifying old, not well-functioning cells and um, basically eating them up or recycling their parts. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the third is um, uh, microbiome dysbiosis. So we're learning about all of these gut organ axes. I believe there are nine of them. Um, our gut impacts our our brain, our skin, and our heart and other organs, and uh, and this is actually shown or, or been found to change uh, dramatically. That is our microbiome uh, composition um, as we age. Mm. Yeah. What are the other ones? The first nine. Uh, good question. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> let's see if I can if I can remember them. I might look at uh, some notes just as a cheat sheet to to recall, but. Um, we can go through each of them. I can give just a very quick overview of what each one of them is. So the first is microbiome, um, sorry, mitochondrial dysfunction. So mitochondria, the power plants of our cells, as we get older, we have fewer of them and those that we do have are not functioning as well. So our cells are not getting as much energy as they would normally be getting to be able to function properly. And obviously energy is, is what enables the cells to carry out their functions. Uh, the second is cellular senescence. So this has grown in popularity in the last couple of years. This is the idea of cells. Oftentimes you'll hear, hear them being referred to as zombie cells. So this is when a cell um, is, is kind of shut down by the body. And sometimes this is because the cell might be cancerous, for example. It's not the only reason, but that is oftentimes uh, one of the reasons why a cell will turn senescent. Uh, and you would think that this is good, and in many ways that is good. You don't want a proliferating cancer cell, for example. But the problem is that these senescent cells can then start secreting inflammatory molecules that then cause nearby cells to also become damaged and eventually can potentially turn senescent as well. And this process increases exponentially as we age. It's actually one of the reasons why our skin wrinkles. So um, cellular senescence is something that a lot of uh, researchers are focusing on to try to uh, destroy these senescent cells with substances called senolytics, which mm -hmm. if you take the derivative of the word, lytic is like lysis, like slide, slicing in half the senescent cell and destroying it. Uh, next is loss of proteostasis. So this is the process, proteostasis is it's the process in which the body is uh, folding pro uh, proteins and making sure that they are actually being utilized properly. As we get older, these proteins can start to accumulate inside of and outside of the cells, and this prevents the cells from being able to function properly. It's almost like garbage accumulating inside and outside of your home, and it's going to make it harder for you to get in and out of your home and, and use it as you otherwise would. And so to that point, the next one is altered intracellular communication. And so uh, our cells, they are a vast network. They are a very advanced uh, network and they are all communicating with each other by secreting molecules that will hit other cells and then those cells will react to those molecules. And so if you have something like loss of proteostasis, just as an example, if it's blocking the receptor sites on these cells, it's going to make it harder for these cells to be able to communicate with each other. And as you can imagine, if cells aren't communicating with each other well, they're not performing the function that they otherwise would. And by extension, the tissue and the organs are not going to be well-equipped or, or fully uh, uh, fulfilling their function uh, given a, a particular circumstance or stressor. Uh, next is genomic instability. So this is one that 
everyone knows of. It's the idea of DNA damage. It's why we wear sunblock, for example, to avoid uh, the damaging effects of ultraviolet rays. And for a long time, it was believed that this is the reason why we get older in like full stop, that this is why we get older. Uh, for decades, this was uh, largely believed, but it's since been found that this is just one component of many, uh, a dozen at least, of the reasons why we get older, but it is nonetheless important. So DNA can become damaged from various stressors, whether that be radiation like ultraviolet radiation or foods that we eat, lifestyle habits, and so on. And these mutations to the DNA can lead to things like cancer, um, or um, require excess cellular division, which to that point, uh, the next hallmark is telomere shortening. And telomeres are the protective end caps of our chromosomes, which our chromosomes contain our DNA. And uh, each time we, we do a cellular division, that telomere is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And it's okay when, when they're relatively long, but eventually you hit something called the telomeric brink, which is when it's kind of like um, the tipping point where your telomeres have become so short that they're not really protecting the DNA as well anymore. And then that's when we see significant increases in different types of diseases. For example, gastrointestinal cancer um, increases when your telomeres are, are too short. Um, and so, as you can imagine, if you have a lot of damage to your cells and DNA, you need to replace those cells more. So your telomeres are going to shorten more frequently or more rapidly, and this is going to contribute to the aging process. Uh, the next one is epigenetic alteration. So on the subject of DNA, uh, DNA is kind of like the hard written uh, code for each one of us. But uh, then from there, the question is which genes are activated and deactivated? And it, it varies per cell and per organ, but it also varies as we age. And as we age, certain genes turn on that shouldn't. For example, they might be pro-inflammatory genes and certain genes turn off that shouldn't. These might be anti-inflammatory genes or protective genes that might repair DNA and so on. And uh, the as we get older, um, these alterations then lead to our bodies not really um, upkeeping themselves as well as they ordinarily would. And that's why there's this whole field uh, called cellular reprogramming that's a lot of um, well-known researchers in the longevity field are focused on trying to reprogram these cells uh, to express a younger epigenome. If, if your audience has ever heard of the term Yamanaka factors, this is where they play in. Um, after that is deregulated nutrient sensing. So nutrients being uh, fats or lipids and uh, uh, carbohydrates, um, sugars, and to some degree, uh, amino acids and uh, proteins. Uh, these nutrients, our body needs to be able to detect them and then know what to do with them. And as we get older, uh, the body is not as capable of doing that. So that's why we see things like blood glucose levels increasing insulin levels increasing, um, triglycerides and LDL cholesterol levels increasing. So uh, this, these are all potentially damaging as those levels get higher and higher, there's a higher occurrence of diseases, um, especially cardiovascular disease. Uh, and then finally, the, the final one of the original nine was stem cell exhaustion. So stem cells are the cells that uh, give birth to all of our new cells, right? They're, they are kind of like the photocopy machine that is then generating all of the copies that we need to be able to survive. And as we get older, our, our stem cells, they become dysfunctional or they die off. And so as a result, our tissues are less replenished and they aren't maintained as well as they otherwise would be. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry, yeah, that's a long list of uh, the hallmarks of aging. And, you know, you can imagine that all of these are so interconnected with each other as well, and they affect each other's function, like autophagy affects mitochondrial function and cell senescence and inflammation. And likewise, inflammation affects genomic stability and until I'm shortening. So yeah, they're very, uh, it's a very complex process, obviously. And even, even now we know the hallmarks of aging kind of, or they're used as the hallmarks of aging then, uh, you know, we still don't have, quote unquote, a cure for aging, or we don't have a solution yet. We're just, you know, learning individually of how do we manipulate these hallmarks and how do we improve, yeah, like the outcomes uh, of people.
Yeah. So all of these interact with each other. That's a great point that you raised. So when one is damaged, uh, the other ones in one way or another are also going to then have a, a negative uh, repercussion from that. Some more directly than others, but ultimately there's kind of a reverberating effect across these. So that's likely part of the reason, at least, why as we get older, we see aging becomes exponential. So the health of someone and even their physical appearance going from 20 to 25 years old is not quite as dramatic as going from 75 to 80 or 80 to 85. As we get older, we see the decline in health um, accelerating. And if you look at charts of morbidity, for example, and mortality, it is literally exponential. So, um, it's largely because of their interactions. And this was an insight that I had back when I was first uh, thinking of the idea for Novos back in 2017, 2018, which was, what if we were to address all of the hallmarks of aging simultaneously, rather than just one or two at a time? Back then, I was attending biotech conferences and I was hearing scientists present with their concepts or with their their companies and the interventions that they were in the R&D phase. And it became immediately apparent that, first of all, most of what they were working on was very far out into the future. It was not anything that I would be able to personally use or uh, share with my, my friends and family and loved ones anytime soon. But the second thing was that they were focusing on only one or two of the mechanisms at a time. And this is largely because of, first of all, just the scientific method of, of uh, being reductionistic, trying to simplify things as much as possible so that they can fully understand it, um, and then only adding complexity after something seems to be fully understood or adequately understood. Uh, the second reason is that the FDA and by extension EFSA in Europe, uh, they want you to focus on specific medical indications. And so uh, the approach for that is oftentimes uh, start with something relatively simple, not to mention when it comes to prescription drugs, for example, it is typically a single molecule that is modified. Maybe they were inspired by nature, it's modified, and then it's patented, but it's nothing, nothing complex. My idea was uh, to create something that was completely natural. All of the ingredients are found in nature and as a result, the ingredients are considered generally recognized as safe or grass status. So the FDA would not stop us from being able to produce this. It would be considered an over-the-counter, safe for general use supplement. And then based on that, I would be able to mix and combine different ingredients that would then be able to have a synergistic effect, at least conceptually. Uh, we have since proven that, but back then it was just a theory to uh, be able to address all of these hallmarks simultaneously. And I talked to scientists, well-known ones, um, and asked them these questions, uh, whether they believe that this would be a ideal approach, an efficacious approach to aging. And it was unanimous agreement. Uh, people from Harvard, uh, MIT, Salk Institute, you name it, uh, they were all in agreement that this would probably have the biggest impact on aging by addressing all of the hallmarks at once. Mm, yeah. And uh, with Novos, you created uh, this uh, Novos Core supplement, the first product that you had, which was yes. there's a drink powder. And uh, what are the ingredients? And like, um, have you done any like clinical trials on this, or what's the like uh, proof of concept kind of? Sure. So, so yeah. So this is Novos Core. Um, yep. It's hard to see with the background filter, but uh, this is Novos Core. It's uh, these daily sachets. So. You tear one open, you pour it into water or into a smoothie. We have orange flavored with no sugar. Um, and then we also have an unflavored version if you put it into a drink, like a smoothie or something. Um, it's the first formula to address the 12 hallmarks of aging. We file for patents on the formula. The ingredients, I can read them off quickly. Um, and then I can tell you about some of the, the research and uh, results that we found from that research. So uh, glycine, Malate, specifically coming from magnesium malate, calcium alpha ketoglutarate, uh, glucosamine sulfate, rhodiola rosea root extract, L-theanine, hyaluronic acid. Um, specifically, believe it or not, um, hyaluronic acid, which is great for skin health from the inside out, hydrating your skin and your joints and so on. Uh, the reason we included it, although that's a nice to have um, was for the acetylglucosamine molecule that is present within hyaluronic acid and has um, lifespan um, extending effects. Uh, mm -hmm. Fisetin, organic ginger root extract, 
pterostilbean and a microdose of lithium, which if you're if you'd like to go into lithium, a lot of people, they, their eyebrows raise when they hear lithium, but there's a great reasons for including lithium. Mm. So, uh, as well as vitamin C, I think I, I left that out. So, uh, the, the uh, results that we've found so far from our formulation, the very first study that we ran was an in vitro study um, at um, a, a lab in uh, New York that had done $7 million worth of studies prior to ours, the same type of study that they ran for us. And they warned us before we commissioned them for the study that they had never really seen any significant benefits from any ingredients, whether prescription or, or over-the-counter natural substances. And we said, let's run the study anyway. And uh, the study, uh, it induced radiation to human cells and there was, of course, the control with no Novos, and then there were different dosages of Novos across um, different different tests. And we found that we were able to reduce DNA damage by as much as 77%. This is in the form of oxidative damage. Uh, the result was so significant that they, the scientists called their CEO to make him aware of the results before they even called us. And I actually, less than a year ago, saw that CEO at a biotech event and asked him firsthand, and he said, yes, like 100%, this was the best results. I mean, we were shocked to see these types of results. So to that point I made earlier about us seeing synergies, this is the first proof point that there is something synergistic happening with our combined ingredients that you wouldn't have seen with these individual ingredients. Mm. The second study we ran was looking at cellular senescence. This was done at an academic lab, uh, Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. And uh, for this, we compared our results to the prescription drug rapamycin. This is the gold standard for longevity drugs. And uh, when looking at cellular senescence, we were able to reduce the size of the senescent cells in, in human cells uh, by the same order of magnitude as rapamycin. We were within percentages of each other. And uh, this was very significant. It was more than a 50% reduction in the size of the senescent cells. Um, so that was amazing for us to see because every researcher compares results to rapamycin. And uh, the fact that we had essentially the same results was, was um, really encouraging for us. Another study that we ran looked at, again, DNA damage, but this time by administering chemotherapeutic um, to uh, human keratinocytes. And so these are skin cells and the chemotherapeutics are incredibly harsh. I mean, they essentially destroy all cells. Um, you know, the hope is that they kill the cancer cells before they kill the person that it's being administered to. That's how intense chemotherapeutics are. And they go beyond oxidative damage to the DNA. They actually cause single and double strand breaks to the DNA. So the analogy I give is oxidative damage is like having a car that starts to rust, whereas a double strand break is like slicing the car down its axle. Like you're completely demolishing, mut mutilating that DNA. And we were able to reduce that by a very significant margin. I can't give exact numbers because we're working on a paper that will be published soon for that, or the researchers at the at the uh, university are. Uh, that was done at University of Bologna, by the way. Uh, but um, uh, that was a very encouraging result. Another result that we have uh, more recently is this process called oxytosis ferroptosis. So this is a process that is associated with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and, and forms of cancer. And um, at the Salk Institute, they ran this study and they compared us to a R&D prescription drug. So this is a drug that has not been approved by the FDA yet, but it is intended specifically for uh, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, and it is targeting this specific um, uh, uh, mechanism being oxytosis, uh, uh, ferroptosis. And we were able to reduce the amounts of oxytosis, ferroptosis by um, halfway between our single most effective ingredient at doing that, which is fisetin, um, and that prescription drug. So again, it goes to show the synergistic nature of our formula, which is that fisetin, which can have an effect on oxytosis, ferroptosis. Um, Novos got 50% closer to this prescription drug that's in R&D for that same process of oxytosis, ferroptosis. We also showed in that same study that we were able to reduce inflammation um, in these human cells as well. And then finally, when it comes to humans, uh, we did a case study 
where we administer uh, biological age tests to people prior to them consuming our Novos Core and Novos Boost formulas. Uh, Novos Boost is just an add-on to Novos Core. It's one single ingredient. It's NMN. Uh, and uh, after six months, they were tested again. Now, we didn't administer the test. It was a third-party lab. So we had you know, we were not in touch with any of the blab res uh, blood lab results or anything that was done independently. The only thing that we did was ship them the Novos products and we asked them to not change their lifestyles. So don't integrate more exercise or uh, watch your diet and make sure you continue to eat essentially the same way that you have been. Try to keep everything constant. And we found that 73% of the participants slowed down their biological pace of aging by a statistically significant margin. Uh, I, I believe it averaged one and a half months per year of slower uh, biological aging, according to the Dunedin pace clock. Second thing is that 0% of people accelerated their aging. You would expect, <clears throat> excuse me, you would expect some people would have accelerated their aging because of lifestyle stressors that come up. You know, maybe they're very stressed at work or they haven't been sleeping as well or they drank some alcohol. But uh, none none of the participants accelerated their aging. And the p-value of this, the probability that this was a coincidence, is less than one in 1,000. So typically a p-value that you need for statistical significance is 0 0.05. For us, it was 0 0.001. So uh, this is enough for us to now be uh, running some clinical trials to try to further validate this. Um, yeah, the last exactly. thing I'll, I'll leave off on is that we have also done a mouse study. I can't share those results yet because it's not complete, but uh, we're very optimistic and we're, we're excited to be able to share those results in, in the months ahead. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, super interesting. And uh, I always like if you, know, you have uh, actual studies on the whatever supplement that <laughs> is being uh, recommended so that uh, you actually see that although you know there are cell studies this is always like the first stages of these uh, this kind of research you first do it in cells then animals and eventually in humans but uh, yeah it always takes time but it's you know good to see some uh, research being done on these uh, molecules but uh, you mentioned uh, the people getting a slower speed of aging if i'm not mistaken then uh, one of the uh, at one of the people at the top of the rejuvenation leaderboard, uh, Julie Clark, Clark, I think she is also taking uh, Novos Core, uh, right? Yeah. So the Rejuvenation Olympics Leadership Board, which had thousands of submissions, Novos as a company, we've got, I believe, uh, four people in the top 10 list. Uh, there's two leadership boards. And so one is the best biological age, and then the other is the relative change. For best biological age, we've got three out of the top 10. And for relative change, we have two of the top 10. Uh, that's more than any other company, if if I recall correctly. And not to mention that we're an over-the-counter, affordable, easy option for people to access, whereas the other companies that are competing are typically medical clinics that are very expensive and uh, are, are under the supervision of medical doctors and so on. So uh, we're all about making things really simple and accessible and achievable. So it's it's that much uh, more, uh, dare I say, impressive that we were able to achieve this with everyday people um, achieving these results. So yes, Julie Gibson Clark, she's been covered by the press a fair amount. If you do a search for her, she, uh, Ben Greenfield recently did a podcast interview with her. It was about an hour long, uh, and she talks about Novos and she, you know, she. As she says herself, she's not compensated. We don't do anything with her. She's not an influencer, nothing like that. She just believes in our product so much. She just wants to get the word out about us. And she's ranked number two uh, globally for her slow pace of aging. We have another woman, Amy Hardison. She's in her 60s. Uh, she is ranked number five, I believe. A guy, Rick Chiovarelli, Chio he's ranked number seven. Um, these people are living relatively normal lifestyles. They're not going even as far as I go with my health. Um, and they're achieving these amazing results. Mm. Yeah. And uh, the I guess like they are doing exercise and eating a good diet and sleeping enough and those kind of things. Um, so it's, you know, in that case, you know, you, it's very hard to know like how big of an effect does certain things play. Like, you know, I, I'm also like, you know, more vigorous exerciser than the average person <laughs> and yeah. i'm more like you know 
um, as a consistent and disciplined uh, with those things. And then it's kind of thinking, okay, we don't know exactly how much exercise is good. And, uh, you know, it's hard to pinpoint exactly the optimal dose with these things. And uh, you need to kind of just experiment yourself and see how does your body react and uh, how does your like other lifestyle factors also like affect that, that uh, those results. Yeah. Yeah. So, so two points to raise. One is that, uh, yes, they are, each of them, it, they are uh, living relatively healthy lifestyles, right? So they are getting good sleep. They are physically active. The guy, Rick, for example, I believe plays pickleball. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Amy um, does uh, cardio, I think five or six days out of the week um, on like an elliptical machine. So they're physically active. They do have, um, uh, you know, adequate sleep. They are eating healthy. They have a lot of vegetables in their diet, but their results, they have, they all improved from the, before they were taking Novos to after mm -hmm. they were taking Novos and their lifestyles did not change significantly. So that's one thing that's important to emphasize. And then to your point about like how much is too much, I think a lot of people, they think more is always more, but sometimes it's not. And uh, this is something I myself need to follow because I'm like you, I push myself very hard. Uh, I just turned 40 this past uh, weekend. And my goal has been to outperform my 20 year old self in many different capacities, everything from uh, my mile time to run one mile. I've gotten myself down to five minutes and 34 seconds. So I'm within just a few seconds of my best time when I was in my twenties. Uh, I'm deadlifting, not as much as my all time max, but considering how fast I'm running, I'm deadlifting, um, relatively speaking more than I ever did while I was running fast. Uh, same thing with pull-ups and so on. So I'm, I'm challenging myself in all these ways, but at the same time, uh, you can overdo it. There was a study that I, I came across, and I can't recall who the authors were. It was it was something I, I saw relatively quickly, but we did publish it on our website in an article where we talk about the effects of exercise on epigenetic aging. And there is an, an analysis done of people in terms of, I believe, their step count. And there is a certain sweet spot for step count for the lowest epigenetic age. And then when people went beyond that, there was a slight increase in the epigenetic age. So you're you're still doing better than most people, like the vast majority of people, if you overdo it, but you're not doing quite as well as those who have the balance. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Like uh, I remember when I did my own doing it in pace tests, then uh, the first time I did a test, like I was doing the least exercise and eating the most calories and I got the best result. <laughs> it's just <laughs> kind of funny. Like I, the first test that I did was 0 0.62 which was like very good, but Amazing, uh, at, that, yeah. at that time I wasn't doing like almost any cardio and I was mostly using weights only. And I was like four kilos heavier than I am right now. And the last test, so I like, I, then I did the first test, I got inspired by this. Okay. I'm going to try to really maximize my like uh, aging speed with this and uh, went more like, let's say uh, regular with cardio. I just started doing more cardio. And I lost about like three to four kilograms as well, of mostly like body fat and maybe a little bit of muscle as well. But uh, the yeah, point is like I did all this effort, but my speed of aging based on the test at least went to like 0 0.65. And uh, then the last test was 0 0.69 as well. <laughs> but I did have like some okay. infections around that time, which do skew the results uh, as well with like COVID and uh, that kind of thing. But yeah, it's kind of funny that you <laughs> want to do more good to your health and you end up, at least based on this test, you might be doing too much. But at the same time, like my VO2 max got higher, my blood work got better. So, you know, it's hard to say which markers are like superior are the traditional biomarkers and traditional blood work, which we have like a lot of data, are those better than this uh, kind of new and novel epigenetic uh, markers, which don't have that much data, but are still kind of interesting to think about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and I wouldn't underestimate the impact that something like COVID could have on your epigenetic results too, because that causes so much inflammation in, in our bodies, not to mention activating the immune system, but as an extension of the immune activation, our bodies become inflamed, and that can definitely have a pronounced impact, less so on the Dunedin pace clock than others, but especially some of the earlier clocks like the Horvath clock and some of the, the clocks that provide a biological age output as opposed to a pace of aging output, uh, those oftentimes can can be significantly impacted by COVID and uh, and, and infections in general. 
And it, it typically seems to be like three to four months that you need to wait before you test again for that to get back down to normal levels again and and, mm. and uh, be a fair test. Gotcha. Yeah, I think I got the COVID somewhere in end of July and I did the test in end of August, the second test and the third test yeah. I think I did. Yeah, in the beginning of October or something like that. So yeah, maybe I haven't tested it again because it's, you know, it's a pretty expensive test and it's something like I don't want to do, uh, you know, six times a year. I'm not going to do the test six times a year. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, that that's within three months, right? Each, mm. each one of those tests that you did after being uh, infected with COVID. So I would consider you know, the possibility of, of doing another one, but I agree with you. I, I have access to these tests. I, I could expense them and do them every week. Um, not that I would do that, but I could, um, I personally do once every six months or so. I think that that's plenty. Um, and for most people, once a year is probably enough because you want to also consider the confounding factor of seasonality, right? Like our lifestyles are considerably different in winter and December than they are in July in the summer. In terms of physical activity, UV exposure, our social lives, the foods we eat, how much alcohol we consume, how much time we spend laying in bed or on a couch versus up and active. So those can really have an impact on, on the pace of aging. So if you want to have a more sound test to see how your lifestyle and supplements and so on are impacting it, I would consider if, if budget is an issue, just do it once a year. Um, and that's kind of talking against my business, right? Like I, I would love to say do it every month, but no, I think once a year is enough. Right. And uh, what are some other like markers you kind of track for your longevity? Like, are there any like valuable biomarkers or blood tests that you think are like a good assessment of aging and uh, longevity? Sure. So besides, besides uh, the epigenetic uh, clocks. Yeah. So well, I'll start with what we have in the Nova's age clock, but then there is a lot more uh, to it than that. So the Nova's age clock in includes the Dunedin pace clock, which is the most accurate and precise of the biological age clocks out there. Uh, there are many other clocks out there on the market that are not transparent about what the algorithm is. Um, and, and many of them actually even use saliva, which is inferior to blood. Uh, but a lot of these tests are actually first generation tests. They're trained on chronological age, which, you know, that might make sense for some sort of uh, uh, detective work. If, if there's a homicide and you try to figure out who the killer was, you want to know how old they are chronologically. It's a clue. Uh, so for forensic science, it makes sense. But for us, what's the point of a test that's going to guesstimate or estimate how old we are chronologically when we have our birth certificate and our license for that, right? We want something that's going to tell us how old we are biologically, which is essentially morbidity risk, mortality risk, and the quality of life metrics. So how likely is it that we can stand up without having to use assistance or how strong our grip strength is or what our gait speed is and so on. So the Dunedin pace clock is trained on all of this and more. Uh, and so we want these later generation tests, the third generation ones. That's why we chose to license the Dunedin and Pace clock, even though we could have made one of our own and been more profitable, it wouldn't have been honest to our consumers, our customers. We wanted to provide the best, and that's why we we licensed Dunedin and Pace. Um, the second is biological age output, which we acknowledge is not as accurate as that first test. So we encourage our customers to really focus on that Dunedin and Pace clock, but People are still curious. They want to know that biological age. So we give it to them, but we caution people not to uh, rely on that so much. And then the third is telomere length. So we talked about telomeres being one of the hallmarks or mechanisms of aging. And uh, the, the key for that is you don't want it to get too short. So when we present the results to you, we present them as a, um, a percentile by your chronological age. And as long as your percentile is something reasonable, 40, 50, or higher, that's great. But if it's in a low percentile, that's something you should keep an eye on because that means that um, it's getting significantly shorter by your age and it might at some point become an issue. So you should look into ways to try to slow slow down um, the shortening of your telomeres. So going beyond our test, uh, other metrics that I look at, you mentioned VO2 max. That's a fantastic one. Uh, I do training to intentionally increase my VO2 max. Um, Let's see, uh, there's also uh, different types of uh, 
metabolomic clocks out there. So there's one that I use called EO, EO Yo, um, or Yo, YOLO. I don't know how exactly they <laughs> pronounce it. I think it's YOLO. It's I O L L O. Like you only live once, right? Uh, so, uh, YOLO, um, uh, measures like more than 600 different biomarkers, and then they provide a biological age output for that. It, it computed mine as being 29% slower aging. By comparison, Dunedin Pace calculates me as being 31% slower aging. So that would be the 0.69 as, as you referenced, you got for one of your results. Um, but then there are, um, uh, also many other, other tests that I've, I've run, um, I, I have access to scientists that are able to run the different algorithms for R and D purposes. In addition, um, just taking the same methylation data and then running it multiple times, and across all of those tests, um, it averages out to thirty nine percent slower aging. So that would be like a 0. 0.61 across. You know, that's the Hanum test and the Horvath test and the Pheno age test and and so on. So there's all of these different algorithms, but I would keep it simple and, and stick with the um, do need and pace. Beyond those, um, obviously, you know, this is a very controversial topic is uh, cholesterol and LDL. And you've got a lot of people saying that LDL is not nearly as damaging as it as it is made out to be. I'm personally conservative about that. I think that there's no proof that it isn't damaging, uh, especially, especially ApoB levels. So uh, I track that and I just naturally have like uh, based on my genetics and, and familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, not super high, but um, above 200 typically. So that's something that I, I keep an eye out on. And now that I'm um, in my 40s, it's something that I would consider uh, potentially a statin for, um, of course, uh, being mindful of side effects and keeping a close eye on that. Um, uh, what else? Um, other things I've looked at, pulse wave velocity. There are devices like the Withing Scale, for example, where you can measure uh, the velocity of your pulse waves and you want that to be as as slow as possible. So somewhat counterintuitive. Everyone thinks faster is better, but actually when it comes to your blood vessels, you want the velocity to be slow because if it's fast, that means that the blood vessels are stiff. So the wave travels faster. And if they're flexible, it's going to move more slowly. So that's something that increases as we age. Diet and exercise can impact that. Even supplements, for example, omega-3s and, and uh, vitamin D can counterintuitively potentially increase your pulse wave velocity, not necessarily permanently in a negative way, but um, uh, acutely um, in the short term while taking the supplements, it might give you a, a, a higher output. So that scale uh, for your American viewers, if you're going to purchase it, you have to make sure you buy the European version because the FDA restricts the US version and doesn't provide the pulse wave velocity as an output. Um, another is visceral fat. That's worth taking a look at. Um, if you're super fit, then you probably have very little. Uh, but for people who are more sedentary, uh, visceral fat is is something that you want to keep an eye out on and make sure that you can reduce that as much as possible. Um, Novos, we, we offer something called face age, which is facial, um, AI, uh, software technology where you can take a selfie and then based on a data set of millions of people, we're able to tell you how young your face is perceived to be. Uh, and it's quite accurate within a couple of years for most people. Uh, but it will also then give you skin health metrics as well, like wrinkles, pore size, uh, skin inflammation and so on. And uh, this is something that you can kind of just keep a track, keep track of, seeing like how your face is is aging over time. To that point, something very interesting. Going back to the Dunedin and Pace study, the researchers uh, actually took this the ten slowest aging people, the ten average aging people, and the ten fastest aging people, and they used computer software to merge each of their faces, both male and female. And when you look at them side by side, so it's it's three males, three females. The 10 slowest aging people, I, I did a, um, a speech at a medical conference called A4M uh, last weekend, and I presented this to people in the audience. I asked them, how old would you guess the 10 slowest aging people were? And they all guessed 35. They were actually 45 years old. And then the 10 fastest aging people who are also 45 years old, how old would you guess they were? And they guessed 55. 
So there's a 20 year gap in perceived age of people who are the fastest aging people according to Dunedin and Pace and the slowest aging people. So that goes to show that what we physically look like can actually be captured by perception of aging. And this face age test uh, that we offer for completely for free, uh, you can find it at novoslabs.com slash face age is also something that's that's pretty cool for people to get a baseline on and then track as as they're proceeding with their longevity journey. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, super interesting with the face uh, part. And uh, I think there are studies of, on centenarian offspring as well. So the people who have apparently good genetics in their family and uh, they do the same kind of computer image of all the people who are in the centenarian offspring group and their face looks also like a slightly younger on average than the regular control people, control group. So yeah, like centenarians obviously just, or most of the centenarians live uh, long because of their genetics. And if you're a centenarian offspring, then you have like a massive reduction in the risk of heart disease and other chronic diseases. And apparently you also like age slower in terms of your facial aging if you have centenarian parents. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure if you ran the Dunedin clock on them, they would also mm. have slower paces of aging relative to the yeah. average person too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like, I mean, the, the, obviously there's dozens of different biomarkers that can also add to the list. Like, you know, you can measure inflammation directly with CRP and, and yep. blood sugar levels and hemoglobin A1C and everything else. So we're not going to go into details with all those uh, markers. But um, so what do you, you do then to achieve good results with your uh, speed of aging and biological ages? And what do you do for your like, overall longevity? What's your routine? My routine, let's see, uh, there's a lot to it. Let's see if I can simplify this. So uh, we'll start with diet. So for food, uh, for the most part, most days of the week, I'm probably eucaloric. So I'm eating as many calories as I'm burning or I'm slightly hypocaloric. Uh, there might be one day a week in the weekends where I might eat a little bit more, have some fun. I'm not as strict with my diet. And so net net, I'm probably more or less eucaloric for, for the week or very slightly hypocaloric. Uh, I uh, do a 16, eight, uh, time restricted feeding window. So, uh, from, uh, basically 12 or 11, eight, 11 AM or 12 PM until about seven or 8 PM is when I will have my last meal, uh, during that feeding window. Uh, on weekdays, I'm having typically relatively low carb meals for most of the day until the evening. That's kind of backwards. Ideally, I'm having the higher carbs in the morning and lower carbs in the evening, just based on metabolism and our body's ability to deal with blood glucose. Uh, but I find that I just focus that much more uh, well when I'm having low carbs during the day uh, with my work. And so it's it's more of a, a choice or a sacrifice that I make uh, by having the carbs later at night. But I find that if I don't have enough carbs at night, my sleep suffers and I track it with, you know, Aura Ring or sometimes with the Apple Watch. And it um, subjectively, I just feel much worse if I, if I go too long having too few carbs. Uh, it's probably something to do with serotonin production and then that being converted to melatonin and me just not sleeping through the night as soundly and not feeling as refreshed in the morning. So I need to get those carbs, especially because I exercise a lot, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and my meals are, are composed of a lot of vegetables, uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, uh, spinach, broccoli, cauliflower, mushrooms, and so on. I have some legumes like um, lots of lentils and, and some other beans as well. Uh, I uh, have a moderate amount of white meat, chicken, poultry. Uh, I'll have um, a moderate amount of whole eggs, including the yolk. I'll have um, a higher amount of fish. Um, I have some like salmon almost every every evening. Um, and if not salmon, then some other type of fish is typically my dinner. Uh, I don't have uh, much, if any, red meat in my diet. If I do, it might be in the form of organ meat, like liver. I'll, I'll have some liver maybe once every two, three, four weeks uh, in my diet, just because they're they're replete with nutrients, lots of nutrients in, in organ meat. Um, and what else? Uh, Post-workout, I'll have a smoothie. That smoothie will 
be based on a uh, uh, a plant-based protein. It's, I believe, pea protein and hemp protein and a couple of others mixed in. But then it also has a lot of different fibers from the plants and and so on. Um, it's the Garden of Life brand that um, I've, I'm currently using. Um, and then I throw in some some other things into that smoothie, including you know um, carrots and celery and some frozen kale, um, some mushroom powder, like a blend of uh, I think six or seven different mushrooms in in the scoop, um, some creatine monohydrate as well. Uh, those are the main things that I have in that smoothie. Uh, mm. and that's like high level overview. That's pretty much what I do for my diet on my blog, slowmyage.com. I do have a blog post specifically talking about diet. And I also mentioned in there, uh, some results from the N Hain study that found that most people, oh, practically everyone, even if they're eating healthy diets, if not having a deficiency in a critical nutrient, they at least have an inadequacy in this, in the critical nutrient. It's typically something like vitamin D or vitamin K, maybe choline, uh, maybe magnesium. So as healthy as I eat and as healthy as many people in your audience eat, you're probably still running some sort of inadequacy. And so that's why I'll also then supplement with just a basic multivitamin, but a uh, very high quality one. So I use the pure encapsulations O-N-E formula, but um, Life Extension brand makes a two per day caps capsule, which is very affordable. I think it's only about ten or twelve dollars a month. Uh, that's another option for for people to consider. So with supplementation, in addition to the multi, of course, I have Novos Core. This is twelve ingredients in one. I have Novos Vital, which is our newest product. So um, this is specifically for organ health in their daily chews. So they aren't quite gummies, but similar texture. Um, they have a sweet tropical flavor to them, but less than one gram of sugar. And the ingredients for this are trehalose, inulin, uh, raw apple cider vinegar containing acetic acid, of course, rudin, natokinase, lutein, and zeaxanthin. So this is essentially seven supplements in one. So, uh, and then I'll have Novos Boost, which is just NMN. So between those three products, I'm getting 20 supplements in very convenient form factors that make it super easy. I'm not, you know, just downing a lot of pills. In terms of other pills, I do take uh, vitamin D plus K, uh, fish oil, omega-3 fish oils. Um, and uh, that's all that's coming to mind at the moment. I might be missing a couple, but... Um, that's the, that's the majority of it. Uh, and then at night, sometimes if, if I've had like a very stressful day and when I say stressful, I'm, I'm mainly referring to like physical stress. Like maybe I worked out too hard and my body is just too amped up. Uh, I, I might have valerian extract that works very well for me to put me to sleep and a time release 300 microgram, um, melatonin. Um, that's pretty much my stack exercise. I, uh, exercise typically six days out of the week. Um, the one day that I don't, it's, I, I'm still active. I'm walking a lot, but I'm not, you know, pushing myself hard. Um, I weight lift three of those days. I used to weight lift more throughout my life, but now I, I've kind of balanced it since I moved to Florida. It's, it's the weather's great. So I want to get outside more and I find myself doing more cardio than weightlifting. Um, but one of those days will be chest triceps. Another will be back biceps. Another, uh, will be, uh, lower body predominantly deadlifts, um, and some, uh, shoulder exercises as well. And then, um, on those days, I will also, um, do like a light run zone two cardio for the most part for about 25 minutes. Um, and then the days that I'm not weightlifting is when I'll push myself harder on the cardio. So on Saturdays, I'm doing a lot of intervals. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I'm trying to outdo my best mile time. So I'll start with a, a two mile light jog warm up. Then I'll run as fast as I can for that mile. Um, and I'm shaving off a couple of seconds each week. And, uh, and then after that, I'll do a bunch of intervals. So whether that be a quarter mile or a half mile or um, as far as I can go for two minutes flat or as far as I can go for one minute flat. And then I'll have walking in, interspersed in between each of those. And I'll typically do between six and eight of those sets. Um, and then other days I'll be doing, um, uh, you know, maybe more extended cardio. Like today I, I, I uh, rode a bicycle for uh, 45 minutes and I was, my heart rate was about 140 beats per minute for that ride. Um, so that's exercise, uh, sleep. I'm very, uh, strict with, um, 
So I have, for example, the Philips Hue light bulbs in my home across my entire home. So uh, when evening is coming, I'll change the light from this this uh, you know blue temperature light to a yellow eventually the orange and then about a half hour before bedtime they'll they'll switch to red um, and that makes it super easy for me to fall asleep when I put my head on the pillow I'm, I'm out within five to ten minutes um, I wear earplugs when I sleep uh, I wear a sleep mask uh, I, I have a girlfriend who you know might turn the light on and get up before me or I have a dog that might make some noise so this helps me to not be as as disturbed uh, for your audience, oftentimes they, they might think that they're sleeping through the night, but the thing is that our, our minds are still hypervigilant while we're sleeping for evolutionary reasons. We want to be aware if there's a predator. So you might be waking up without even realizing it, right? These micro arousals that can take place anytime there's a, a noise or a flash of light or something. So I try to minimize the chances that any of that happens throughout the night. And my, my quality of sleep is, is, is quite good as a result of that. Um, am I missing anything? Um, no, I think, yeah, I mean, these are the in terms of most categories. interesting topics people are interested in, like the supplements and the exercise routines. Of course, there's many like other things like stress management and those things, but uh, it's not like as exciting for a lot of people. <laughs> but what do you think, uh, you know, I mean, there's like a lot of people are doing very similar things in regards to like the exercise regularity, they have a good diet and they take some supplements. What do you think is like the biggest um determining factor for your health and uh like uh, results what, what what would be like okay this is the actual secret sauce that people like uh, tend to uh, neglect or underestimate yeah well so i'll i'll first acknowledge that i'm biased um i do really believe that novos is having a significant impact on on my results and uh I, i'll give just a quick case in point example um uh, my father he uh, had an epigenetic test done prior to us launching Novos Age. It was a, a third-party epigenetic test, and he uh, uh, his result came back as one year younger than his biological age. Uh, sorry, his chronological age. Uh, and then after taking our formula for six months, his result came back as minus 10 years from his chronological age. Right. We've also seen the results in our case study. We see the results from people like Julie, Amy, Rick, uh, a, a woman named Lil Esky, who I didn't mention earlier. Um, my my results, on the other hand, I never had the before Novos test. Uh, I didn't try epigenetic testing before I had R&D versions of Novos. Before we launched for the public, I was taking my product for more than a year. Uh, and so I don't have that before test, unfortunately. But seeing the results from other people, also seeing the results from my father, who is genetically related to me, um, being so significant, I do think that uh, at least a significant portion of my results are coming from it. Now, with that said, if I was living an unhealthy lifestyle, like uh, smoking a pack a day and laying on the couch and not eating healthy, eating junk food, um, I would not be in this place. I mean, if I look at my genes, which I have, um, I have a number of obesogenic genes. I have family history of obesity, family history of cardiovascular disease, family history of cancer. My mother passed away from pancreatic cancer while I was starting Novos. So um, I don't think I would be in a good place, not to mention I have my brain tumor, which I mentioned earlier. So I don't think I would be in a good place if I wasn't living a healthy lifestyle in and of itself. So that's the foundation. I think everyone should get a handle over their sleep, eat a lot more vegetables than they currently are, minimize the processed foods, and just be active. You don't have to run and lift like I do, but at least spend 90 minutes a day, ideally, uh, just moving, like walking, dancing, doing whatever it is, for you. Um, you can wear an Oculus headset and break a sweat playing ping pong for all I care, right? But like be active, do something for 90 minutes a day. I think if you have that foundation, I think that that's going to get you, it's like Pareto's principle, 80% of the way. And then different hacks like um, our, my formula. I would say also maybe consider uh, the B vitamins, which you can find in the multivitamins I was mentioning, but like getting adequate B vi vitamins and methyl donors from foods like egg yolks, which contain choline and methyl donors, or trimethylglycine, um, or supplementing with choline. Uh, these things can also help to optimize your methylation. And these tests, these epigenetic tests, are based on methylation. So I think that that would also probably play a significant role in my results too. Mm. Do you think your 
like peaking <laughs> right now you're 40 years old are you like peaking with your health and fitness and uh, biological age results or do you think you still have uh, more rooms for gains <laughs> i i think i have more room for gains i i have not felt I mean, throughout my life, I, I haven't felt as healthy as I feel now, right? And and there's no sign of that um, eclipsing. So, if if I look back over the like my 30s, I wasn't running as fast as I am now. So that entire decade of my 30s, I wasn't running this fast, including the second half of my 20s, I wasn't running this fast. I was running a lot, but I wasn't running at this speed. Partly because I wasn't pushing myself, admittedly, to to run at this pace. This is a new goal. Like when I turned 30, my goal was to do more pull-ups than I ever did in my life. And I wanted to outdo the Guinness record for more pull-ups in 60 seconds. Um, and I, I personally hit more than 50 pull-ups. Uh, I think it was 54 pull-ups in 60 seconds. That was my goal at 30. Uh, and now my goal at 40 is to outdo my running time for the mile. But... Um, being able to achieve these numbers that I was achieving in my early 20s while also balancing things like power lift with deadlift and pull up reps as I'm doing right now about 36, 37 pull ups in a set. Not my personal best, but when you consider everything holistically, I'm feeling as good as I ever have. So I don't think I'm I'm on the decline. I think that I'm, I'm kind of steady state. I'm not going to argue I'll be healthier than my entire life going forward, but to be able to maintain this for a long time, I think I can. Mm. Yeah, it's like a very important mindset uh, point as well that, you know, with age, these numbers go down, like your strength and and your biomarkers get worse, etc. But if you hold yourself to that standard, so to say like, oh, I'm 40 now, so it's okay for me to have this lower, let's say, uh, lower status of health, then you're kind of falling victim to this uh, you know, mindset of that, uh, you know, it's okay to be uh, in your age group, kind of, <laughs> when ideally you want to be, you're like, you know, a few few years younger than your chronological age to effectively slow down the speed of aging. And uh, ideally be like, you know, 10 to up to 20 years younger with these uh, markers. So to have like a, you know, a VO2 max that is 10 to 20 years younger than a chronological, chronological age and uh, have uh, the muscle strength that is you know decades younger than your chronological age and uh, the other biomarkers as well to maintain like more youthful uh, markers for as long as possible yeah so i i'm inspired by every so often i'll see on social media uh, i guess the algorithm knows me well um videos of people in their 70s 80s 90s doing things that you don't even see people in their 30s doing like for example last night I saw a video of a of a woman, I believe she's German, who's 98 years old doing uh, gymnastics. And she's doing better gymnastics than uh, the typical, I mean, the, well, than practically anyone, since most people don't do gymnastics, but mm. um, performing better than probably 40-year-old gymnasts um, are. And at 98 years old, it just goes to show that if you put the effort in and you are disciplined and persistent and you don't fall off track significantly, you can maintain this for a long time. Another video I watched was at um, at the Penn Relays at University of Pennsylvania, seeing people in their 70s running faster times than if I, if I were to take a random assortment of 100 people age, you know, in their 30s, I bet you this guy would have beat practically every single one of them. Um, mm -hmm. Again, yeah. because he's disciplined and persistent. So it goes to show that like these these stats that you see for people as they get older, these are 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 general stats. They aren't individuals. You have these individual outliers. And that's what I'm curious of is how much of an outlier can I be? I'm not going to say that because the average 50 year old is not as capable as they were when they were 20, that I couldn't be 50 and be just as capable as I was when I was 25 years old. Mm. Yeah, I think the 98-year-old gymnast, I think you might have seen my post on uh, Instagram where I made a reel about her and the video oh, okay. the, the video got like 10 million views, so it went kind of very viral. And even that's maybe you might have seen that particular video from my, uh, <laughs> my stories. It and, probably uh, was. Th thank you for that video. It inspired me last night. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, that's the reason it went viral. It got 10 million views because uh, the kind of ama amazing story of a 98-year-old I think in the video she was 91, but I mean, still a 91 year old uh, woman doing uh, planches, doing handstand on the on the parallel bars, and yeah, that's doing what I saw. Kinds of amazing tricks. So yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. I was, I, was, 
I was showing my girlfriend and, and her father who's who's visiting from out of town and saying like, that's a planche mm -hmm. and practically nobody is ever able in their yeah. entire life to do a planche. And she's in her 90s doing a planche. That is yeah. unbelievably impressive. Yeah, most like, yeah, 20 year olds aren't gonna do that as well. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's many stories of that, like this uh, 100 year old uh, sprinter who was like at the world record for the seniors and he ran like 60 meters or something uh, in 18 seconds or something like that. So it's pretty, pretty uh, like amazing to see old people maintaining like such high levels of uh, fitness into their, uh, you know, late years. Yeah. And then, and then my question is how much better will we be able to do, right? Because we are, um, although there's this, um, this split between the average person who is unfortunately very unhealthy. Um, and then those like us who are more healthy than people were, uh, you know, at our age 50 years ago. So then the question becomes, what could we, if we maintain this, what could we potentially do when we're 90 or 100, especially because we learn that much more about aging, new interventions are invented or discovered. So in theory, we can potentially do quite a bit better by the time we hit those ages, or at mm -hmm. least that's the hope. Yeah, yeah, the longevity is key philosophy. philosophy. The velocity is also something, yeah, many people hope is gonna happen, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, been great to talk with you, and uh, I think people learned quite a valuable information. So, where can people learn more about you? Where can they find uh, Novos, and where can they learn more about your work? Sure. So, learn ab about me, the things that I, my interventions, my biological results. I share on my blog. It's slowmyage.com, and I'm also on X and Instagram, and I, I believe. Recently, we set up a, a TikTok account, though I'm not on that as much um, as Slow My Age. And then Novos, of course, is NovosLabs.com. We're on all of the social networks. And uh, we didn't have a chance to talk about this, but we are also in the process of rolling out a free mobile app. This app is going to provide a free biological age clock output that is based on a survey and it leverages AI. It was produced at University of Washington. Uh, we collaborated with their researchers to get it into our app. It's more accurate than the first generation blood tests. So the Horvath clock, for example, this is more accurate than that based on a survey, 100% free on our app. It's called Novos Life. In addition to that, we also then provide free lifestyle guidance based on how you respond to questions. We'll then provide you with personalized guidance for how to improve your uh, your biological age and essentially your longevity lifestyle. And then there's also an AI trained bot within the app to be able to answer any specific questions you might have. That bot will typically have the the answer for you trained by Novos and our researchers. Gotcha. We'll put the links in the show notes. And my last Great. question is, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Well, I, I think, um, although I, I learned this 10 years ago, I wish I learned it even uh, earlier is, as I mentioned before, the fact that aging is malleable. It is something that we can have a real impact on. And that I think that's the most empowering thing. When we, as a company, advertise our products on social networks, we oftentimes hear from people that aging is something that's like written into our genetics or God will decide how long they live and so on. And I just can't help but feel like that's disempowering. It's it's feeling like it's not up to you and the decisions you make to determine how healthy and long you live. And the more people that we can educate and inform and make them aware that the decisions they make can and will slow down their aging, which will then provide so many more benefits in terms of enjoying life and making the most out of life and spending more time with your loved ones and them with you. And that's ultimately what this is all about. And uh, I think that that's one of the most important lessons that I've learned in the in the past decade. Mm. Yeah, it's like, you know, it means that the effort you put in can actually, you know, determine your results or can uh, give you greater, um, you know, uh, returns in the future. If you just take care of your health now, then, you know, you're going to be that 100 year old sprinter <laughs> and uh, <laughs> doing planches when you're 90 years old. Exactly. Reduce the suffering in the world. That's how I look at it. 
Yeah, well, uh, it's been great talking with you. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming to the podcast. Of course, great to talk with you too. Thank you.